So let's talk about the four components that make up scar tissue, because this is really interesting. And there's sort of four main elements that we want to be thinking about when we are thinking about scar tissue. So first is the quality. We're talking about quality of collagen here. Then we're thinking about quantity. How much is there? And then we're thinking about orientation, like which direction is it? And juiciness, this is Kathy's word, which I think is terrific. How much fluid is in there? And any of, if any of these are out of balance, they can create some kind of problematic or pathophysiological scar tissue. So let's go a little bit deeper into each of these components. Now, first of all, quality. So you know if you buy something that's poor quality, it breaks down really quickly. It's not something that you can rely on for a long period of time. It's the same with collagen. So if you're not getting healthy collagen, then the quality of it is poor. How it is formed is not as effective and it may be more prone to degeneration. And if it starts to degenerate, then it can lead to problematic scar tissue. So we want healthy collagen. We want it to be nice and smooth. We want it to have some kind of elasticity to it. It's not super stretchy, but it, you don't want it to be rigid and brittle either. So Kathy, what was your, um, your metaphor with the rope on that? Well, with, with collagen, you know, there are certain features that are, that are required for that collagen strand of collagen or bundles of collagen, you know, to be able to do the job that they're supposed to do. And, and some of the important things with collagen is that, you know, it's not stretchy like an elastic band like muscle is, but it does have some degree of pliability to it. And, and a couple of the features that allow for it to have that kind of capacity for some degree of pliability are, is crimp. So there's, it's kind of like back in the day when I was a kid, before we had iPads and stuff like that, we'd take construction paper and we'd cut and we'd make these long strips of piece of paper and then we'd fold them. So it'd make like an accordion <laughs> that this, you know, zigzag crimpy or like a slinky, you know, those toys back in the, back in the day. So it had this collagen, healthy collagen has this crimpy kind of feature to it. So when, when collagen is forming, if it doesn't have appropriate crimp and certainly the hydration or the juiciness of the collagen factors into its capacity to be somewhat pliable as well. Super cool. Yeah. Now, in, in addition to the quality of it, we want to think about the quantity. So this is in terms of how much is there. And the volume of collagen that's created can definitely influence the consistency of the scar tissue. Now, if you have a lot of collagen, then you're gonna be thinking about scars that are more like keloids or hypertrophics where they're having this overproduction of collagen and it's creating this pathological scar tissue. But also you may not have an even distribution of collagen. So maybe there's more collagen in an area of a scar and less in another area. And it will create this sort of inconsistency in, in tone and, and thickness and rigidity in the scar tissue itself. So this is, this is a really important component and, and, and I believe it's something that we can influence with our hands. What do you think about that, Kathy? Yeah, and I think if I think one of the misconceptions, something that I hear quite frequently when I'm teaching the scar tissue course is, is most people assume that a problematic scar means there's too much collagen. You know, like if you're talking about like a hypertrophic scar where you have these areas where it's raised and it's thickened and lumpy and bumpy. But you know, it, it's not just the amount of collagen, but it's also the quality of that collagen so that the collagen has its natural or normal features that help it to perform in the way that it need, needs to. Yeah, and I just found this really cool article uh, yesterday, I believe, which I need to go into it more, but it's talking about the different types of scars where some are hypervascular and some are hyper collagenetic. I think I just made up that word, but I think it's a good one. And, and those that changes the quality of the scar tissue if it's got a lot of blood vessels versus a lot of collagen. And um, 
we'll be looking more into that and probably bring more of that information to you during the scar tissue course, which is coming up in September that Kathy and I are teaching. But uh, yeah, there's new research coming out all the time on scar tissue, which is really amazing. And the, yeah, like what it's made of seems to have a very large influence on how it functions and how the person experiences the scar tissue itself. Absolutely. You know, as I mentioned earlier, any, any tissue that we have needs proper nerve supply, blood and lymphatic as well. And with scars, sometimes it's an overdue, sometimes it's an underdue. So sometimes the tissue is avascular, meaning that it doesn't have the right amount of blood supply that is needed in order for that tissue to be to function in a, in a healthy way. So some of those things can go either, either way. Sometimes it can be a, an overproduction, sometimes it's an underproduction. And same thing with new nerves. Nerve, blood, and lymphatic vessels do regenerate after after injury, you know, within a, a reasonable degree, let's say, um, you know, but sometimes there's a there's difficulty in those structures as they're forming to reach the tissue that it needs to get to. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Dr. Jeffrey Bove. He did some scar tissue research with Susan Chappelle, also BCRMT, a while back, and I had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, Jeff at the fascia congresses a while back and I ran into him a few years later and said hey you know what's new what's going on in your lab and he said well one of the really interesting things that I'm seeing is that newly forming nerves have a really hard time pushing through dense gnarly tissue and I'm like oh my god that's so amazing from my perspective as someone who works with scar tissue so if we're getting you know, we talk about this classic overproduction of collagen and it's fibrotic, it's gnarly, and it's kind of dense and compact, you know, that potentially could impact that area of scar tissue, you know, getting new blood vessels, new lymphatic vessels, new nerve supply uh, coming into the area because it's tougher for those newly forming structures to push through denser material. Yeah, which makes total sense to me. I think that that's a really good inference on your behalf. Dr. Yeah. Jeff, Jeffrey Bove, and it's with a G, not a J. Jove, like G-O-V-E? Bove. Bo oh, but Bove. his first, first name is Jeffrey with a G, not a J. Uh, gotcha, gotcha. Just, just for those of you who are going okay. to ask Dr. Jeffrey who? So let's now talk about orientation because orientation is really important. So this is what direction it's laid down, yes, in terms of is it parallel, is it cross-linked, is it higgledy-piggledy like spaghetti on a plate, but also you want to think about how close together or how spread apart it is. Are the fibers really dense and clustered like they would be in a tendon, or are they more spread apart with more space between them like they would be in the superficial fascia? And also, also thinking about the 3D torque and glide because it's not one dimensional, it's three dimensional. So it has to be able to work in three dimensions. It has to be able to move and hopefully promote that functional movement in the body without it actually causing restriction or inhibition. Yeah, so for the most part, some of our denser types of fascia, um, like tendon, for example, the collagen bundles for the most part are fairly linear because of the task that's being required for them to do. Whereas the deep fascia, which creates kind of a container around a musculature or envelopes around a musculature, um, you know, the, the collagen is structured, is oriented differently to allow for three-dimensional expansion, um, you know, as we move and do things. That's so cool. I just think it's so fascinating. It's like all the different things that the body can do. So, you know, it's not only the collagen fibers and their quality, how many of them, how they're arranged, but it's also the fluidity of the area. And this is what Kathy was mentioning with the juiciness. So we want to think about the ground substance that it's in, that, you know, how viscous it is, how fluid it is, or if there's not very much, how dry and adhered is the area? What do you have to say about that, 
juiciness there? Yeah, I mean, juiciness is a, is a really important component with respect to just the tissue health and well-being and viability, but also factors into the capacity for sliding or gliding with reference to its neighbor, um, as well as, you know, it's, it's a, a vehicle for, for nutrients, you know, to come in and bathe around the tissues as well. So very important. And as well, fluid to a certain degree helps to create some space. So it allows for a little bit of space between articulating structures. So there can be that movement too, rather than them being too close together with the potential of slightly getting tethered or stuck together. So, you know, a lot of importance with respect to the ability for collagen to have its, its healthy fluid content around the fiber itself and as well with, within the fiber also. Very cool.